You're listening to the Sunny Brown Breakdown. Now it is time to break it down. Awesome, mate. Thank you so much again for giving me your time. Now, let, I th- thought I'd start off just by telling you how I've come across your stuff, okay? Um, which was through your work with BJJ Globetrotters. Um, someone shared with me one of your seminar videos and it was the video on the panda. And I, I started watching it and look, I got to be honest, I spent a lot of time scratching my head just thinking I couldn't quite understand exactly what it was that you were showing. And then I get to the, I get to the end of the video and you do explain that it's, you know, it is from folk star wrestling, college wrestling, NCAA, the short, and it was the short sit essentially. And, and it just, and it, and it really it made me think, I just still couldn't quite understand what it was you were showing. And then, so I took that to my, to my wrestling coach, who I'm lucky enough to train with a folk style wrestler and showed him, still scratching my head. And he's like, Sonny, you know, I've been doing that since I was 10 years old. What, what's, what is this? But the more I thought about it, I, I think I get where you were possibly going. I watched some more of your other videos and it seemed to be that there was a difference with you in, in two areas, one being what you taught and how you taught it. And so I was thinking like for the positions that you're teaching with like, uh, say Panda running man, even, even the turtle positions, are you, or let's just focus on Panda specifically to begin with. Are these like, how do you see these positions fitting into jujitsu as a whole? Are they positions from like, are you trying to define transitional positions or where do you see it fitting into the game? Well, actually, uh, I will actually film today with Ronald. That's kind of a couple of meters from me right now sitting there. Yep. I will film a new video about, uh, let's say, the idea I call, like, let's say, at the moment, six plus two side control, bottom. Mm-hmm. Because there seems to be, like, like uh, you know, totally belly down and totally flat on your back would be very bad positions, yeah? Correct. In another, another story would be why Jiu-Jitsu is teaching most escapes being flat on their back anyway. That's, I consider it a very bad idea. But there seems to be like a, a six positions in Jiu-Jitsu in a bottom game that I use that we have defined that are so-called bottom positions. And only one of them, the crazy part is like only one of them is the position that is facing the opponent. All other positions are a little bit showing shoulder, showing more back, showing less back. I, let's say I can have running man, uh, let's say uh, I'm facing you right now, let's a uh, little bit like an angle maybe. Mm-hmm. Then I can do running man towards you. So kind of putting my chest on a mat more like, you know, going to the turtle towards you. Mm-hmm. I can have running man away from you. That's the second one. I can get, uh, we call it still like a hawking position, but I can tilt my shoulder away from you. So that's third. I can have a panda. I can have third turtle. So that's five. And only me facing towards you is one position that's mostly everybody's teaching. So okay. we have actually, let's say, we, we have defined those five positions that also exist in jiu-jitsu that I know very few people actually spend time on getting good. Okay. Uh, and uh, so those pandas and running mans and hawkings that I also – I play with names these days could be like, you know, turtle, uh, panda would be sitting turtle. Uh, so running man could be like a half turtle. So everything is more like a back exposure. So in that sense, I call everything a little bit a turtle. So I play with names, you know, mm-hmm. so that would, that would show the unification of the system. So other way people see like, Oh, it's a hawking, it's a running man. They, they're like separate mo- moves, mm-hmm. but they all carry the same idea in them. That's basically starts with turtle like the way I do it. And uh, so those pandas and stuff, they're all defensive structures that I can stay long enough in. And also that we call them trenches, also in English. So the idea is that I, basically that I start with, everything is motion, but you can't teach it to the beginner because it's so complex. So you start with uh, still frames from the motion. So you can really define running man, hawking, panda, turtle, everything else. 
and those are still frames we call zero points, we call them trenches. You can keep them, you can fight for keeping them, and also you can learn how to move between them. And the, the end goal is to never stop. The okay. end goal is always move, even like a five centimeters an hour, but the goal is to always move, like always be a moving target and very defensive, like in, you know, in a boxing match. You never stay still. Mm -hmm. But so, you teach so people more like position, like if they can separately stay there as a beginners, and then by time they, they move more and more and more. Okay, so. excellent. So the, the idea then of the still frames in the motion, the trenches, is like these positions will come up oftentimes, many times during a roll, but they haven't really been defined out enough in jiu-jitsu and taught separately. So those, those positions that, we go through, that you're going through will happen quickly, but they'll happen a lot. And so you're saying that we should take those, they happen enough, even if they're only momentarily, and teach them as their separate skills because over the length of a role, we might be there dozens of times and we should build up our, our skills in these particular areas. Yes, because just, you know, going very fast to a turtle from side control, or let's say away to turtle, uh, that takes skill because that's a very big motion. And you can lose a fight or win a fight during that. But if you, you know, chunk them down, it also, you know, against the beginners, uh, if the beginner chunks it down against the advanced guys, that's not even fight anyway, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but for a beginner, you learn separate moves. And then you, you can do as many in a row as you can. And maybe you combine three in a row and then fourth one is a trench you, you, you rest in, you know? And then you do two moves in a row, two postures in a row, and then you rest. As a beginner, you do one move, rest, one move, rest. And as a more advanced guy, you see all the time those scrambles, they do three to five moves in a row and then certain stability happens. So, I get you. So, so, and also, I guess, those positions that running man, hawking and pandas and stuff, they're, they're separated from each other by the distance enough that we can, we can say that's a different position. Because, you know, I can do still frames like, you know, every second still frames, yeah? Mm -hmm. Then you would have like 100 positions like in a row. That would be insane. So those, those positions are different enough so we can go like, okay, this is a position, that's the position, and then let's manage the transition. Mm -hmm. But the transition is also, you know, still frames, but we, we skip that, do it, do it faster. Understand what I mean? I think I do. So we, ha we have those, those still frames that you say that you've broken down with the transitions from, from Panda to Turtle to Running Man that are, that are micro positions that, that may come up often in roles. And then while the beginner might be able to transition slowly between them, as people get more advanced, it'll just happen much quicker. To the, and then to the un, untrained eye, it might not look like any position was established at all, and we just call it a scramble. So that's that's basically it because I actually can do it in a. I'm not, you know I'm not a world class athlete in that sense, but and I also know my level against who I can do it, you know. But I can do it in my level, and that's a black belt level. I can use those single positions and stay there against other black belts. So the choice is uh, I give choice to people. So if you're more tired, you can use more often trenches. If you're more fresh, and also we say like, um, like environment dictates the tactics. So if you're in competition, the clock is there, do faster, be better shape, you know, move, don't stop. But if you're rolling around, then there's no time limit, like lots of time in camps, people just roll, you know, when submission happens, it can be 20 minutes. So I cannot, I'm 42 years old, so I can't go like, you know, five minutes explosive and then I'm just dying out next like 15 minutes. So mm -hmm. my game is very builds up. I'm adapting to people a lot and uh, my game fits more like a no time limit stuff. So I can just see what people do, steal their timing and then start to work my thing. Because uh, usually my game these days is just capitalizing on over committing of attacks because that, that what I can do myself is very weird for most people. And uh, they usually start overcommit because nothing's there, and it's I'm, I can really shut down like pretty much a lot of attacks. And they start overcommit, and I build traps to use them. So yep. I also like I, a lot of things from turtle. I do like you know turn like turnovers, 
because mm -hmm. people trying to put like seat belts in and everything else and try to choke me and so I'm basically like a I'm like making a joke a little bit, becoming like a Tellus game because Tellus game, Eduardo Tellus game was basically full turtle to some, they, he ran ran over people or to the did, did the role. And then in a top position, he looked for Kimuras and stuff. So I can understand him now these days more. Yeah. And but, uh, so the and idea that you explained actually was pretty correct that you, what, what you used. Yeah. Okay. So that, that helps me get my head around it. Um, like I said, I've been, I've been trying to rack my brain all week, just trying to figure it out. And so you make a good point. Eduardo Taylor seems to be like one of the only well-known jujitsu turtle players in, in the game. But when we go to something like folk style wrestling, like there's so, there's so much to work from, from that position. Um, one thing you've also brought up, uh, I think is just that crossover between folk style wrestling and jujitsu. And I was very interested finding that you were from Estonia, uh, the home of the legendary catch wrestler, George Hackenschmidt. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so there's that strong, you know, of course, folk style wrestling, NCAA came from catch wrestling. Um, so there's that strong connection. And I was very interested to find out your opinions then of what further can be integrated from, NCAA collegiate folk style wrestling back into jujitsu. Yeah, it's just I like wrestling. The, my usual argument is they've done it longer. Sometimes, if somebody has done it longer, it's not an argument. You know, sometimes people justify pointless traditions of you know being hundred years old, but really, it's a hundred, a couple of thousand years. Let's say practice like wrestling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they just have figured out so many things and their attitude towards sports is more aggressive. They're more fighters and that's why they build more MMA fighters these days because their work ethic and everything else is way bigger. And they can't you know, rest in that sense. They work, work, work. And I think so many, so many aspects of uh, wrestling actually transfer jiu-jitsu. You know, the panda would be that sit-out. And in wrestling, they practice it a lot. You know, they do referee positions a lot. There are statistics. You can correct me and I, I, if I'm wrong, but there's st statistics of escaping the referee position to stand up to neutral to gain one point is over 50%, I think. Yeah, my coach tells me that he would always take the uh, bottom position to escape because for him, it was a free point. He knows yeah, he's getting so, up. So that shows also that, you know, escaping is a very, if you train that also, then you can actually do it. And but in Jiu-Jitsu, I feel the escaping part uh, is like, people have not thought it out very much, you know, in passing and guard and there's grip sequences and everything else. But when it comes to escaping, most people is that they're mostly flat doing frames. And it's really like, a, they're a little bit like a couple of a decade behind of just figuring out how the escaping works. And then you mentioned Edward Atellas, it just boggles my mind that, that why the turtle is dying out art because I even have argument that IBGF competitions could be a perfect environment to, uh, for turtle to uh, thrive because that's one way to avoid three points. So people should figure out very, very fast how to avoid uh, guard passes, go to turtle, you know, people get advantage, you know, get back to guard and win the advantage back. It's easier to win advantage back than three points. So, but it's weird that we don't see that used in jiu-jitsu and just turtle is like, I, all the time when I'm traveling these days, I hear so many misconceptions. Don't expose your back. Don't do this. Back is, you know, if you uh, throw your back, they will take your back. And, and uh, people are avoiding that, like I said, in the beginning of intro and like five positions that will happen and just concentrating on that one. And it's, that's really stressful. And also the way I guess you've seen I do, you know, arms low, protecting my neck and I, I I guess I use also frames but not in that context that usually you see and it's very hard to get underhooks on me and then I don't need to use those traditional frames so much I just you know use stiff arm maybe and but it's very super hard to cross face me and everything else so I think I'm trying to you know I, I'm not scratching the surface I think there's already you know it's already pretty deep but I think people need to have like a certain paradigm shift towards escaping that you actually can turn away and go and you can turn also in and that if you have both directions then you can play with jab cross a lot mm -hmm. uh, fake one and do other and everything opens up more 
so in that sense, uh, yeah, there's lots, lots to do in uh, escapes. And also wrestling, what, what also transfers a lot. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm very proud of that. That, I, uh, that I've, we call it unsweepable. Okay. There's a system, kind of like against the sweeps in jiu-jitsu, uh, that tries to answer uh, with moves called uh, Elvis, butt sprawl and forest. Elvis would be like, you know, turning the knees in and doing Elvis Presley. Butt sprawl would be like, uh, you know, on your butt, but head forward, mm -hmm. uh, not like a sprawl. And uh, forest would be like a run, forest, run. You know, like, uh, like wrestlers call it a kick out also. Okay, yeah. They just, so we just have more fancier names. And we try to answer uh, gi and no gi sweep problems with the early, mid and late level, late stages using wrestling tactics. Uh, how do, you know, how to uh, be a higher man, how to attack their legs, and how to put their weight back to their upper body so I could stand up faster than them. So I use a lot of wrestling uh, ideas, how, how they scramble, how they you know, defend takedowns and stuff, uh, to just understand how it could be done in jiu-jitsu because that knowledge also as a defending sweep is, uh, my mind is a little bit missing systematically because we see random sweep defenses here and there, Mm -hmm. But if you look at like NCAA, like uh, how they, every second you do this, then you're late, you do this, then you're late, you do this. They have everything sequenced out in a timing wise. And you can have many versions of defense and they, it's uh, fascinating. And then I guess you get good in some timing and randomly it happens. But I like as a coach, I have a system. Mm -hmm. I'm not forcing you to one timing, but I also show you early, mid and late. And then it's up to you to figure out what happens against what try against beginners more late, you know, competition, be early, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, so there's room that, like, like I said, environment dictates the tactics, but wrestling has helped me a lot and staying on top more and fighting for top and being that kind of annoying person that don't fall. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and also in wrestlers, um, I've encountered the Estonian wrestlers. I have, Alo Tom is one of the best uh, Preet, I'll just get you to stop. I think the mic is getting um, the mic is getting bumped. Bumped? Yeah. Oh, that's that sounds okay now. Okay. That's cool. that's all right. I will hold it like this. Okay. So, and uh, also, I used uh, my, I used I was sparred with years ago with uh, many years ago with Alo Dom. It's one of the best Estonian, uh, like uh, Estonian Greco-Roman guys, and he basically killed my jiu-jitsu back in the day with just parterre being on top. Yeah, okay. And he was talking, talking about just keeping his shoulder parallel to the mat, not letting him tilt anything. And that's why we have a, also, I use a lot of terminology in jiu-jitsu. We call them Greco-Roman shoulders. That means like, you know, keeping it more parallel, not letting you tilt yourself over 45 degrees. So I've, I've got a lot of inspiration from wrestling. So I really appreciate what I've done. So, yeah. Okay. That's a short answer. Beautiful. No, that's, that's definitely answering my questions. So one thing you've brought up is a couple of times making uh, metaphors or parallels between how we train jujitsu and how we train, uh, how boxing is trained. And I want to delve into that a little bit because I think I was trying to get my head around that as well. And I was thinking it seemed to be a relation to how you thought that boxing is, is a sport and jujitsu is maybe not trained as a sport. And yeah. I was thinking, is it, say, for a rear naked choke defense where your first emphasis would be to uh, tuck the chin, bring the shoulders up, which is something that everyone learns over time, that that is probably the most important thing to do. But yet to a beginner, we might teach them to pull the hand down after it's already over our head and clear the neck. And is it that you're kind of making the comparison that we might teach jujitsu the way we would teach boxing if it was teaching a boxer instead of to how to parry to how to respond after being hit five times. Uh, I'm, I'm more thinking when I compare the boxing, I'm more thinking about the sport aspect of it. And also uh, you can use the same as wrestling. Uh, let's say, a uh, stupid question. Have you ever seen a wrestler do a double leg without a snap down? So it's a, always a setup. Mm -hmm. So uh, everything in boxing and wrestling is usually taught with a setup. So in jiu-jitsu, let's say you just, oh, I take an underhook, you know. So how do you, how do you take an underhook? For example, you see many videos of, uh, like open up any YouTube video about turtle attacks. 
And people are like, oh, I get a seatbelt here, now I take it back. So I'm like, no, 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 no. Show me how you get the seatbelt. Because I, I, I can tell you my own you know, experience is not that easy when you do defense nicely. So you have to uh, fake it open, play tricks, you know, timing wise. And then like, you know, like, like you would play open a boxing guard. Mm -hmm. So fake left and right, move around and then lure them out to reach maybe. And then you're in. So first of all, we have to talk about that when we're teaching Jiu Jitsu. So it's a sport. And also what, uh, what my, <laughs> let's say again, uh, jokingly, what my uh, black belt, Chris Paint, I guess, from Stafford said nicely that I'm trying to teach Jiu-Jitsu when, when you fight out of the posture. So you would go like, uh, you know, it's not like technique, 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 but if you fail, do it again. If you fail, do it again. So I'm trying to more like, a, like I'm fighting out of the posture and then coming in. I'm not trying to build like a lock flows or something. I'm being very, like you saw in the Banda video, somebody gets underhook, I pummel in. Mm -hmm. Somebody gets underhook, I pummel in. So I can build a complex technical, you know, exchange there. Like, you know, you do this, I do that, you do then this, I do that. And it's, but that makes, takes super much time. So, and, uh, but if I just, you know, deny you the pummeling and pummel elbowing, I'm doing a more like a, you know, wrestling and sport manner. I'm keeping it simple and I'm just referring to my posture. And let's say, I don't know, I have, a, I have a grilled chicken, you know, open guard retention system or guard, whatever it was, whatever it is. So I'm fighting out of the one position. I'm keeping the structure like a guard up and I'm fighting out of that position. If I fail, I pull everything back. So there's a, there also like open guard zero point. So when I'm talking about boxing and stuff, I'm saying like we should concentrate on those positions and maybe the options what we teach are then more optional, so to speak. If you want to do more, you can do more, but you can actually get away with less. And also, I guess I'm advocating uh, one theory would be that I think in Jiu-Jitsu we teach, we teach too much crazy combinations mm -hmm. that, we never seen in a, that we never see in a fight happening in a you know, mid to high level sport, our sport. Mm -hmm. So because people run out of techniques very early you know and then and then the sweeps has to get crazier and crazier i'm saying that keep the open guard still do the same goddamn tripod sweep forever understand so you don't have to get like a but then the question is how do you make it interesting because people get bored that's a good question yes and the question is you have to teach this as a sport so because if you make a like a, if somebody does boxing and then you teach them a jab and then it's like introduction phase and that's it and then another day you teach a jab that's it it becomes boring in a week but if you do jab games yep then the jab will get it will stay interesting forever because you can do jab games against better guys and everything else you know mm -hmm. have different rules about jab games you know so and let's say arm bar from side control like you know far arm side control mm -hmm. if you just do a typical class of you know half an hour warm up, three techniques uh, randomly picked and then you spar in half an hour, this is a very bad class mm -hmm. because you will not integrate those three techniques to a game later. So how I would do it, let's say, is sport manner would be you, as a beginner, you take the really close to armbar finish position and you resist. If your success ratio is like, you know, five out of 10, you move one step back. You move one step back from the armbar, and you try it again resistance till the end. And black belt, you can start pretty much from the pass, having the underhook, and then you work yourself against resistance to the armbar. So that simple armbar that you learn pretty much in first day can stay interesting forever because you add resistance to it, and it becomes like isolation sparring, isolation drilling. Depends on your level. Because against another black belt, I think if you're a black belt, you should not do 100% because their defense is good when you're learning something new. So against another black belt, you would use maybe, they would use maybe 60, 70% resistance mm -hmm. and you would you know, try the armbar. If you succeed too much, raise the resistance. If, you, uh, if you're a black belt and you do it against purple belt, go 100%. They can resist 100% and your job is to do armbar. Because you have to do those techniques, what you see in reality. Yeah.
Yep. Like scientific process is you, you watch the reality and you test, uh, you test the reality and if the results are different than reality, your test is wrong. So we should watch fights, you know, purple belts and up probably more. And also understand that also innovation happens in a bottom level and see what, you know, what techniques come through. But basically, we should do those locks and submissions and sweeps. And if you see what actually works in the highest level, it's not much, actually. There's a certain amount of techniques that works you know, again and again and again, and there's some more less, and there's also some exceptions. And those techniques you can pretty much, let's say, stupidly learn in a year. Mm -hmm. After that, you're done. So then how do you keep the interest? That means drilling, resistance training, progressive resistance training, and then keep it interesting with games. Mm -hmm. but, but people don't do that often. And then it becomes like, you know, like regular Jitsu class, it becomes like a crazy De La Riva sweep from something that you actually never seen and you use and you go like, why we're doing this? Because the teaching methodology is more technique based. So guys, you know, you know those things. Oh, guys, you're here, you know? Yep. And then random crazy five times switching grips, something falling sweep. And then you end up in a sparring and you can never pull it off. And that's also another, other usually that uh, coaches, um, I will mess with coaches' head like this, that it's, uh, you have to take it, uh, the, now what I'm saying in a specific context, because it can be argued and, you know, said, that's not about it. That's not correct. But let's say in two, in one week, that ordinary person trains twice. Mm -hmm. And it's fair to say that in those two classes, you've learned two techniques. Yeah, like, you know, maybe they're connected, maybe they're not. So in one week, you have four new things that your coach picked for you, and you can never forget. So in two weeks, you have eight things. And then in a month, you have 16 new sweep submissions that you can never forget. Mm. So you can do the math, yeah? Yep. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. And then you can go like, Preet, it's not fair because, you know, not everything is technique. Okay, I will give you that. I say, let's cut it in half. Let's say eight. You will have eight new sweep submissions. And I'm also talking in a stage, not like, you know, first day learning because then it's the techniques are more, you know, you learn more stuff. But later, after a beginning stage, you're, you know, I'm talking about that stage more. Yep. And then still you have eight new things in a month. You, can, you have to put in your game, work your timing and everything. And as a black belt, I cannot do it. No. I cannot put eight new things in my game. And we're asking this from people. And you know that what, what you ask any beginner, like white belt, blue belt, and uh, you ask them that everybody says it's too much. It's too much techniques. They forget the every week techniques. There's no time to you know, practice them, to figure out the timing against different opponents. And they're struggling. And it also makes them look stupid because it, they think it's their fault. And it's actually, it's not. But if you, if you only would teach, let's say, you know, let's talk about armbar, far, ar, far side armbar, you would do it uh, like a, a month. Then people would say, oh, but it would be boring. Yes, if you teach it in a technique, technique manner. It would be very interesting for a month if you do it like always with a progressive resistance, alive drilling. Mm -hmm. And then it, people would be very interesting because if you get success, you just move further from the goal and you start from the later from the goal. Yeah. Okay. And you just work yourself again towards that arm bar and you really can pull it off in a sparring because you're mimicking reality. Mm -hmm. But if you do a typical class of, you know, half an hour warm up, one technique, 10 minutes dead, second technique, 10 minutes dead, sometimes even third, and then you roll, you create environment where you never, you never basically as a beginner try those things you learned in a class in a sparring because the resistance kicks in, the timing is there and your failing rate is too big and your motivation goes down right away. Okay. So in that sense, I'm more, I, because I haven't, I haven't learned jujitsu as a, I guess we did like, you know, progressive drilling, but as a more, as a, even like a sport, con, like a concept of sport, it was still a little bit an art. Yeah. Uh, but so um, these days I'm advocating more. We have to teach it more as, an, as a sport more. Still it's an art, you know, and uh, sport also is an art form. But uh, I think that, you know, those lock flows or you sometimes people do techniques very specific, you know, you open the guard, you do a knee slide, you take an underhook and do armbar. Mm -hmm. That's the worst teaching method ever. 
in jiu-jitsu because you give them super specific option from the from the you know from the chaos mm-hmm. and for that option to happen it has to be a miracle so i rather teach like uh you know like a how to work a jab and so it's like many like a, you learn to make options yourself like if you uh, okay so so timing is like okay options are here and there and then you work and they resist but they have to lose their coach the training partner so it's about you learn also timing when to change techniques and not specific poetry like a, just one two three four but because in a fight you know that they're going to resist and nothing's working like if you have to do five techniques to work an armbar that means they have to do a five consistent mistakes and what's the likelihood of that happening Mm. so they look cool for beginners i know why they're appealing but those techniques will fall apart like in a second when you try them in a fight it can be that specific uh, technique can also be some coaches polished technique after 10 years so that will be their their specific exception that they that they built for 10 years but what is your argument to teach it to others that it takes you uh, 10 years to force that specific role, rule, rule, you understand? So people have to find their own combinations that work for them. So how do you build up that environment? And only by sports. Doing the live drilling, progressive resistance, and people learning about the timing and making their own choices. Sure. So more about, you know, that's a, I, I hope you got the, like an like a idea that I'm advocating more. I think I, I, think I did. So it's more about giving them the main tools or like maybe the main notes. If I was to use a musical metaphor, we're giving them the main notes and then letting them play their own song or get the t- like on their own timing. Yeah. Using the, do, using those, you know, those positions also escaping ways, the Hawking running man. So I am never about escapes. I'm about survival. Mm-hmm. So I will make you survive using those four positions. I will teach you how to keep them, how to transfer between them, and escape is yours. So you can do a stiff arm, rollover, pull guard, spin, stand up, who cares? You would have to know those options. But what we will pick is about like a specific situation. Mm-hmm. So we could do a drills where your main objective will be safe and then if there's a call out drill, escape like a 10 minute, 10 second window. Or if the drill is, you can just find escapes yourself. And then you feel when do you escape? Because it's a feeling process. And they can resist more, they can resist less, and you will figure out the timings and when to do what. Mm. But my, my, my thing is to keep you safe. Like, let's say in a boxing also, I give you a footwork. I teach you to bob and weave and slip and duck. And then keep your arms up. And then punching, when to punch, you have to figure out yourself. Mm-hmm. Because that's what you find out with uh, working with a resisting, progressively resisting opponent, doing drills. But you have to be safe that you don't get hit. And then you figure out what the time you have to punch. Okay. So I'm more about that. Okay. And so when you would teach the armbar and have progressive drills doing that, then when would you teach uh, in that class or, or just in general the defense to that armbar? Uh, that's a good question because uh, I'm also struggling that it's, uh, like, let's say, struggling with uh, teaching it more as a sport than a sport because I haven't learned it that way myself. Mm-hmm. But I also see how wrestlers and boxers do it. Then I'm trying to move forward more like towards the sport aspect of it. So our typical class is like maybe 10, 12 minutes of warm up, then uh, 18 minutes maybe uh, technique like introduction, trying stuff out, and 30 minutes of drilling with uh, progressive resistance, uh, the same techniques, and having feedback loops and everything else in it. So, uh, but what's the fun part also? What I did I think last year was uh, I taught uh, uh, Dars Anaconda defense in my club for I think two or three months. And what happened was everybody got good in darses and anacondas. You understand? Yep. Because finishing darses and anacondas was interesting because I upped the defense. So I taught people uh, what is the basic understanding of darks and anaconda, how the, those stroke works. And then I started to teach them escapes. And then we did progressive drills. So if they could escape, they could hunt for darses and anacondas better. Mm-hmm. And what happened is 
on Aquandas and Darces, they got better by themselves because people were interested to in killing those defenses. So they got to learn anything, everything about how to, how to destroy stuff. You know, still, it was a defense class, so they had to mostly give them a way out, but they can always develop also chokes. Because when you, when you don't do defense, what happens is uh, the people get bored finishing submissions. Understand? Because if the defense is low, they do an Aconda, and they do it again, and they, could, they can't escape, and then motivation goes down, and you, you want a new lock. Yeah. So it's weird that if you teach the defense also, and I, I tried it last year in my, in my club. I literally did it like, and people just Anaconda darts three months, so I could do both skills. I could do defense and uh, actually attack in three months together. So if you ask a question, how you would teach an armbar, then in that case, I would say uh, do an armbar, and then I would have to, in some classes, show the defender the right things to do against an armbar and do it slow so your injury risk is low. And then another guy that finishing armbar tries to overcome those things. But the defender has to do the right thing. Otherwise, you're just you know, getting, the, trying to finish an armbar against the stupid people. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that would not get you anywhere. So defense has to be intelligent. So they have to do the right thing, you know, like some hitchhike stuff or whatever I put in my YouTube, you know, turning the reverse hitchhike, you know, yep. maybe you have seen that. So I would have to teach them the right things, what to do, so they could develop their defense also and also lose. But it's fun to lose because you know what you have to do and you just make it better. And if you make it better, people are, again, more interesting of finishing those arm bars because your defense is up again and I'm still having fun. Because if you don't up your defense, it's getting boring to finish those arm bars. That's why also I use the methodology of moving away from the arm bar, you know, got it, getting more and more, more further away from arm bar because it makes it interesting because it's harder to get to the arm bar then. So you can make the drill interesting by moving away or also upping the defense or both. So you okay. can actually both ways defense and then, you know, they attack and they lose or they, you do attacks and just teach the uh, bottom guy to get smarter. So give them ideas that they can play with as a defensive partner. And then their also defense actually gets really good. But they also learn to lose. And it's fun to try defense when you lose, when you're training partner as a coach. So there's nothing personal. You have to lose. Yeah? So the mindset of losing is different and they're having more fun experimenting with defense and losing. Mm -hmm. So I'm more about teaching like that. And I think it makes more sense. That is fascinating, the idea of you know, focusing then on defense as a way to improve people's offense. Um, I hadn't thought of it like that's that. The but... only way pretty much to push the defense. It's the only way to push the attack up is to have a defense. That, By the way, everybody got bored. That makes sense. So let's, let's break down just that drilling even a little bit further. So when you do the progressive resistance with the armbar, the, like, would you say you would let it uh, be extended at different levels for like a beginner might just have to try and, um, you know, they might not even have a grip located, but the, you know, a black belt obviously would be with a full defense locked in, or is it just the person's uh, energy that they're putting into the defense? Uh, let's say, good question. Uh, depends. Let's say if you're a, let's take extremes, white belt and black belt. Yeah. It, that's why those white belts and black belts can train in the same class and both are having fun actually, if you do it better. So white belt, if they're, if they're partnered up with a black belt, then I would suggest white belt starts in a very end of an arm bar against the black belt. And pretty much, I think they can tap the black belt out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they will go the very end, elbow to the stomach, and just go up, and then black belt taps. So if you get that awesome feeling as a white belt, you see everybody's uh, human, you know, black belts are human. So you know that they need that self-boost, self-confidence boost, that they see it's possible. You know, otherwise the black belts, they seem like God when you're white belt. And uh, so then even white belt says in the first class, oh, it's boring because I already tapped you like, you know, five out of 10. So then maybe you, as a black belt, you start from here, even like, even like this. And then you wiggle with a warm arm a little bit here and they have to straighten it. As a white belt, that's enough already for you, yeah? So you learn to deal with that complexity. 
And then you can add maybe, you know, they connect and then you learn to shut down the other arm or you, or you pull the arm in yep. and then you break the other arm. So you add complexity as a, as a, and for a white belt, it's, uh, it's fun. And for a black belt, it's very fun to train very late escapes because if the escape would be earlier, their success ratio would be higher and then the motivation is down because it's boring. Yeah. And so, and if you're a black belt, and you train with a white belt, then basically the uh, right thing to do would be if you, whatever arm bar you want to do, like a far side arm bar, you would start from the knee slide position. Like having maybe ankle trap between the legs. You have an underhook and you have a, you know, pulling the arm and you have to work your leg out from knee slide. You have to work yourself around the head and do the arm bar. Against a white belt, I guess for a black belt would be interesting. If you have a success, then just go open guard. Mm -hmm. Try to pass their guard, certain knee slides, whatever you choose, certain specific you want to work, and then get to an arm bar. Then against the white belt, learning this way, even, against the, even for a black belt is interesting. Yeah, so yeah. You, you, you create your own kind of resistance that is manageable and that gives you, you, know, gives you something. Because then maybe you learn like, uh, you, you know that end is easier because they're white belts. They don't know that escapes. But you can train different passing combinations to armbar because that's the class. Understand? Yep. So you create your own complexity against the white belts. You're not just going like knee slide, knee slide because that's easy. But you combine knee slide that maybe you make a rule that you have to do combination passing and then you're allowed to go armbar. So you play with them a little bit, train your passing combinations, and you look for armbar during transitions. And you go for a finish because as a black belt, that's interesting for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can build up that, com you know, and then maybe it's a blue belt and brown belt or purple or, you know, blue. Then you figure out what is your resistance level that, you know, rocks your world, so to, be, so to speak, that keeps you motivated. Mm -hmm. So, and then, uh, yeah, so one, one person's drill can be very limited and other guys can do isolation sparring basically in the same class because the level is there. Yep. And they can they can do it for themselves. So uh, I think this makes more sense. Uh, it's it's making sense to me. And now uh, I want to touch on an idea which I think links up to that, which is the idea of uh, peer teaching, uh, which I think you touch on, which is having your partners also work as a coach, um, yeah. which I think is an excellent idea in that. As, as coaches of jiu-jitsu classes or, or any class, it's very difficult to get around and see everyone. And if everyone's partner could be coaching them and helping them, that's going to improve rapid. It's going to help the rate of improvement. But it's also something that's normally shied away from in any type of class where if someone's given someone else advice, it might be seen as, you know, just I just want to hear from the, from the head coach. How, how do you feel that that can be worked successfully into jujitsu training where everyone is, every, all the peers are all coaching each other? I do it. I think if I coaching, Ronald can also maybe look at me weirdly when I say it, but I think every time I coach, I do it literally every class. So I think it would be very dangerous idea and not let people coach each other. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's how you find out, you know, about people. Because, uh, you know, white belts are, and blue belts are one of the most passionate people about jiu-jitsu. So if you just tell them, do not coach because you will coach the wrong things. And I know they want to coach, you know, latest sweep from YouTube, you know. And they're like passionate stuff. So that's why some coaches say, oh, as a white belt, blue belt, you can't coach, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's one extreme. But actually, I would use white belts and blue belts because they're one of the most, like I said, passionate people. So the hard trick is how to use them correctly. Yes. So every would, class. Do that. Yes. Yeah. Every class. So what I do is now it's impossible even with uh, 20 or even 10 people in a class to monitor everybody equally during the drill. It's very, I, I just, I see overall mistakes, you know, what sticks out overall and I will give my feedback to people, but I can monitor what you do in two minutes. Like I have to look around. So but people need attention. People need feedback and everything else. So, that's why we had feedback loops. Let's say the drill is two minutes, progressive resistance. So after the drill, if the bottom guy was a, you know, was a, was a guy that was resisting, so they, will, they will tell the top guy what was good, but what could have been better. 
and you can do as a white belt even this, uh, because you only tell them the points that I told you to watch. So if the class was about, you know, uh, get the underhook, uh, put this knee on a mat and some other cues, as a white belt, you only coach those cues. You watch how good they do those things that coach pointed out. If you have more knowledge about jiu-jitsu, more experience, you can coach other things also. Yeah, so, and then maybe second time you do the drill again and you can also go like add a feedback. What, what was better than last time? What is good? What, what could have been better? You know, what you need to work on. And then uh, the, even like a 50 people class or a 50 people cl camp or whatever can be, can feel as a private class because you get actually private feedback for you. And that's everybody wants. And, uh, and that also creates a social interaction. People talk to each other, uh, help each other, uh, care, care f about each other. If you don't know the guy, somebody's new is there, you introduce yourself, ask their name. So even the new person can be a fly on a wall. They are, they are being talked to right away. So they don't disappear to the class and like, oh, I'm a new here, nobody talks to me. Right away, socially accepted even allowed to criticize other other belts even the higher belts by the cues that coach gave them yeah? because mm -hmm. they're learning to criticize and if you're a blue belt and you're a you know fairly white belt then you don't go like ah shut up you know you're a white belt what can you know they they're gonna coach they're gonna criticize the cues that i gave them and you as a blue belt you can shut them down and be an asshole or you can encourage them like oh that was a good feedback yeah yeah that was nice that you noticed those things. I felt them do, yeah, blah, 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 you know? Mm -hmm. So you encourage white belts to give feedback and they just get, you know, better and they understand they do a good job and they learn to care. And if they care, you return the favor. And, you know, this it's a nice social game. Yeah, yeah. so so that's how I usually use it. And I, I give the over, overall, like, feedback. Like, I saw everybody had trouble with that, so we cover more that specifically. And um, so this kind of feedback, it's crazy that it's not happening actually in classes because any sports book or whatever you pick up, everything is about feedback, feedback, feedback. And then you can't, you can't give feedback to 40 people and then people feel strangers and, and then, uh, you know, kind of, it's weird. So yeah. I know people use different, um, and I know people use different methodologies to build unity and, you know, I make a purposely joke about, you know, we clap in the classes and, you know, one, two clap, but there's better ways or, you know, more ways to build unity in, and everybody feels connected and stuff by just having good methodologies. And feedback is one of them. Yeah. Every class I, I, I use feedback and I think the basic understanding is this, what I explained right now. Yeah. And I, I really like that idea. Actually, I think it's something that could definitely be implemented when when implemented well could be of great benefit to everyone in in a club especially as you mentioned the social aspect bring of bringing people together and helping stop people maybe leave that jiu-jitsu club or drop out maybe at, at white or blue belt yes and one of the things also i, I said about white belts and blue belts uh, that let's say those positions yeah like we talked about you know panda turtle hawking and stuff if if they know that, the blue belts, they pass on that knowledge. I'm totally fine with that. Because if they roll with white belt, no, no, you, get to, you have to get better hawking. You have to get better turtle. And they're fixing their elbows, you know, they're fixing their stuff. And I'm super happy about that. So I just give them a framework what to pass on. So, and, uh, so don't teach them, you know, that also the way I think they learn under me, they understand what's important, not lay the sweep and those positions. And if people know those positions, I don't mind if they, you know, teach somebody a goofy sweep also in some point, but they know what they have to pass on, those postures. And if they arm bar, if they arm bar a white belt, they go like, oh, you need better, you know, running man or something. Keep your elbows more tight. Fix this knee position and stay there. So they're coaching the right things. Yeah. So then I have soldiers around that coaching the right things and every, everything is good. I, I like that I have coaches around that they help white belts and stuff, but I need to, they need to know what they can pass on and, and I let them teach. So I don't think it's a bad thing uh, at all. I think it's a very, you have to encourage people and that's how you find out who wants to be coached, who's not. And, uh, you know, they get better by coaching already starting a white belt and then 
if they're getting purples and stuff, maybe they're interested in coaching, but they already coached like many years by helping others. So it's not like, oh, I'm a competitor, I start to coach. You will suck at coaching mostly. So you grow into the coaching and it's, you know, there's so many good benefits of letting people coach and, you know, those things that I, I know it's important and also correcting them in some point and giving feedback about coaching and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good structure in that, I, I think. Yeah, that's, it's, it sounds great. In just, yeah, help, helping keep people involved. And I've also heard you refer to the importance of defense to be taught as first things to white belts to stop them from becoming disinterested and just getting, just getting smashed. Is that, is that something that has informed your coaching style? I, I, if you would ask how it started, I wouldn't know. Like, okay. what was the trigger or whatever it was. Uh, I, I, wouldn't tell, I couldn't tell you. Uh, but in that sense, it also makes sense. Like, if you take boxing, yeah? So, from where would you start your punches? You wouldn't just go like, uh, just jab and cross. Mm-hmm. Usually, you go like, okay, you have defense. You know, and then you move around and then you punch. It's very logical in that sense. You don't go like, okay, that's a jab. It, from where the punch comes. So in jiu-jitsu, I think there's a two arguments to be made. Uh, let's say uh, one, one way would be like, okay, you, you, you can teach people how to dominate in mount against people who don't know how to, be in, how to do mount escapes. And you definitely have better, better success of keeping them there because they don't know escapes. And then you flip the table because you teach them, you know, escapes. And then uh, against that top guy that was in a mount. And then you again, you know, teach the attacking stuff because now dominating against person that knows something about defense. So you can start this way. But also you can start the other way by actually showing that mount is one of the worst positions in a fight you can end up. Somebody mounts you and you can get out. I think that mental mental win is better understand yes that uh, they don't know they can squeeze out however they want they can keep you there and you actually know defense and you escape the mount you know and then make the top guy better and then make escape or better so there's two ways of starting jiu-jitsu i can i i, I actually i i have tried both so that's one way people can make their mind because both make sense in that sense also i think as a as a defensive structure for beginners uh i think if you cannot survive your your beginning years then jiu-jitsu will be super hard because you just get submitted left and right and you have no clue why and people always if you you know if you open up any article about what to do when you're a beginner in jiu-jitsu most of them are about survival you have to survive but have you seen I'm really cocky about that when I say it. You know, you'd have to take it in a real, again, right context. I'm really cocky about that. That Have you seen a, a, a good survival system that is out there, let's say, in some gym or DVD? There's none. Yeah? You haven't. If, because it seems like I'm doing something and probably some people doing something, but everybody even that puts up uh, videos about uh, defensive structures, they don't talk about turtles turning away having the pandas, turning running man in and out. They only talk about I'm flat on my back and I have frames. You know, there's no full defensive structure that actually defense is about. Yeah, They're okay. teaching chunk and you go like, okay, that's it. But that's not enough. You have to teach everything there is. And then, yes, you can argue that it's better to turn in than away. I, I agree with that, but you have to have them both. Mm-hmm. And then let people make decisions. Because we clearly see they both work. People use getting up, turning away in MMA all the time, and they're actually getting up. So why are we not teaching those things? In jiu-jitsu, there's enough evidence, people turning away, getting up, escaping, everything. But we're still saying that's bad. Wrestlers are pointing out that you can actually turn your back and get out. So the evidence is there. So why we're no, 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 back exposure is back. Yes, we agree it's back. But you still have to do it. Mm. And if you have a chance... You escape earlier, but if many cases people are good, so you don't have that chance. So what to do then? You're, you can't turn in and you're afraid to turn away and you flatten yourself out, basically. So that yeah. is a very yeah. dangerous mindset to have. 
So, so if people are talking about survival and survival, then I'm actually, my, I'm feeling maybe somebody else somewhere, but I'm actually trying to come up with a system. And there is already a system that answers that problem, that I can make beginners less tappable. They have better chance of surviving. They, have, they don't give underhooks away. They're, they're more, let's say, they're harder to tap out. And even if they get tapped out, they exactly know why, because they gave elbow away. They didn't wrist fight. Uh, they, something was wrong in their trench. They didn't get there soon enough. So now losing becomes fun. And you exactly know why you lose. And uh, then it's good, because I don't mind losing when I know why I lose. But if I don't know why I'm losing, whatever game I play, it frustrates the shit out of me because I have no clue what my choices are making, you know? So then it's, what's the point? I do a choice and I get the results that I, I didn't wish for. So, but if you just know the choices and then you just make it better, it's like my system is pretty much like a jab. You learn it, you suffer, and it takes usually six months to a year to understand the jab and really make it work, you know, the timing and the defense and their counters and stuff, you know, really you can throw a jab as a beginner. Mm. But it's not like you're going to fail and go to a coach, oh, give me a... Um, anyway, what the, yeah, so survival, sorry. Yep. Uh, so that's... that's um, so I'm teaching usually also like escapes differently in that sense that I'm spending some consider even way too much time on those positions. And then, but then I can, if they know all those positions, transitions, they can add any escape they want to the system. So, and some people are, you know, prefer some escapes. So I don't teach them a style. I teach them everything, kind of sit up, sitting up, turtling, pulling guard. And because you need jack, cross and hook, and then you can, you know, trick people. Uh, but, and then you just spend time perfecting it. And then you get bored of doing one escape and then you add something else and who cares? Mm -hmm. So I give you the freedom to do anything. And so it's a different way of teaching jujitsu, kind of, because you will get super bored. I get all the time this feedback that, Preet, when should I attack from those defensive structures? And my answer is whenever you want. And then it's like, but uh, that's your choice. If you get super bored, attack faster, attack sooner, but that's your choice. So people are getting very comfortable using those positions and then it, the choice is theirs, what they want to do with that, you know. As, you know, then you have to roll with the beginners, then you're willing to attack more. If you roll with more with higher belts, you attack less. So if you want to learn how to attack more, if you're a purple belt, roll with beginners, white belts, try to put some, you know, attacks there. And, sorry, and if you ask what kind of attacks, I would say open up you to figure it out. Sure. So I can... Yeah, I can show you some, but usually just watch matches. Uh, who's your idols? Uh, what they do? How they, you know, what weight class are you in? Maybe even so. So you, it's like um, I give you half, and you have to give yourself a half. Mm -hmm. I can guide you a little bit, but but it's like you know, like a dad teaching his kid, like dad, what I wanna, what should I be in life? You go like, I have no clue. You figure it out. My job is just keep you alive. You know. Yeah. And uh, so I keep you alive and I support you and then, you know, give you a good example that how, how I live and then you make your own choices and we can discuss about your choices, but those are your choices. Yeah. So I think that's functional. It sounds very functional um, <laughs> to me. And, and speaking of functional, I like, if you've seen my videos, I'm always focused on what works in MMA. Uh, what works in UFC specifically. And that's another thing that stood out to me is I've, I've currently been working on a breakdown of Robert Whittaker's takedown defense and against Yoel Romero, he's turning his back and pummeling back in. And you brought that up in, uh, in your seminars. Um, and I also uh, had a chance to, uh, if you saw the uh, Robbie Lawler versus Colby Covington fight, where in the first round after watching that Panda video, it kind of looked like, he was going to panda or if that, if you want to talk on that take uh, on that choke defense, if you managed to see it um, or just what you thought of is happening with Robert Whittaker. The Whittaker one was uh, uh, Whittaker one was, I was very like, like giggling when he did 
you know, he did a sit out and try to go to turtle and stand up and he was using active turtle. And uh, also I think he used, uh, in my, I call it active turtle, he used active turtle against Jacare. So yeah. I was really surprised how well uh, Whitaker did against Jacare because Jacare is pretty good. And he was, you know, posting one arm, leaning against the cage, one leg up, keeping the hooks out with his elbow. Yep. So, uh, so that MMA thing, um, people sometimes ask, uh, Preet, how, what, what is your, how is your side control works in MMA? First of all, if you have seen my side control, I'm usually grabbing your arm, you know, in the bottom. If I'm sideways, I'm grabbing your arm. So that means you can't really punch with that arm. And so other arm, you hold onto me. So then I know exactly where you are. So if you punch with that arm, I'm gone. If you have to pull this arm free, it's actually pretty good control. So if you pull it out really much, that gives me space. And then I'm gone. So the, and the point is usually also what, what I haven't been teaching because people's, you know, it's still, it's a, even in my gym, it's a new system because I've done it also only that complete like last two years. So there's been earlier versions in my gyms, but it's right now getting really polished at everything. So uh, it really comes, like the English, they say it like comes to his own or something. Sure. It's really, really getting, getting polished. And uh, so the key is, like I said before, never stop. So if you move around and being like a moving target, then it's, I make you grapple me. So if I'm static, yes, you can punch me. I can still do my escapes and stuff, but... My point is to always move around, be a moving target. And then you have to hold on to me and any punch you do is not coming from the balance point. And then I guess in MMA you get hit, but it's about, you know, how do you get hit and how much and, you know, from where. So people get hit, but it's, if there's no like a weight behind it, it's off balance, then it's, you know, you can take those punches easily. Uh, if I'm being oh, actually honest with you, mm -hmm. I haven't watched... I couldn't, or something, it's a very busy time at the moment. That's okay. I, I saw, I'm trying to click on that. Um, there is just, there is a moment in the Robbie Lawler, uh, Colby Covington fight where it's, Co Covington's trying to get the back, the, the hand under the neck, and Robbie Lawler is just sitting there, chin tucked, shoulders up, and, you know, keeping... So it's a, it's a first round in third, third minute. Successfully, yeah. successfully. Wait, it's a third round, and in... Uh, Third minutes, I guess. Uh, for, yeah, so the first round, three minutes in. If you, can, if you can see that. Yeah, so there's been pandas and stuff around, you know? Mm -hmm. And I usually, if people always ask, like, you know, what is the panda? So I usually tell, like, the wrestling sit-out. Yeah. So Which... it's, uh, it's about in a two-minute mark, I guess, then, if you go backwards. Or is it three-minute mark? I think like... it's three minutes in because it starts then... Three minutes, there's a turtle. He talk, yeah. See, yep. he turned away, nothing happened. So turning away and playing your back forward happens. So there's turtle. Yep. He forces up. No, he's, he's kind of fun. Uh, he's a three, so minutes into the three minutes into the first round. So two minutes left in the round, it should be. Yes. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's actually doing that, yes. You could say it's like, you know, panda position. He's a little bit leaning back, but, but as you see, he couldn't choke and now he's getting up to turtle. See? Then even like choke is gone. He's sitting against the cage, arm on a mat. He can't take his back. See? Evidence. That's, that's, I thought you might enjoy that clip because it was one thing. Yeah. I just watched your seminar video and I'm thinking, trying to get my head around it. And then I see this in the, in the UFC and I'm thinking there's got to be something there. In a highest sport, in a highest level of our sport, you can argue maybe Colvington is maybe, you know, not the best jiu-jitsu guy in the world. But if the choke would be there, he could, if he could punch, he would punch Laurel to the head a lot, you know? Yeah. And uh, he could finish something, but he, he don't, doesn't punch so much. He's not a, you know, a good angle. And Laurel is good. And then he stands up and then it's a body lock fight a little bit. Mm -hmm. So awesome. So I was right. <laughs> so yeah, I, th I thought you'd I thought you'd enjoy that enjoy that clip. because that's the same thing that started. This is awesome because uh, now the evidence is piling up that you know it's a, when I when I say I'm right, I'm kind of joking about it. But the evidence is piling up that why we why we're ignoring certain things that we clearly see work, mm -hmm. and people go like, no, no, it's exception. No, 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 
it, if that happens like even in the highest level and there's more evidence about it's happening more. So we have to study wh why he's that safe, why the choke is gone, why he can stay there that well. well so, and it's uh, also like the same, same idea started my closed guard kind of tantrum, so to speak, because if you remember the match between Carlos Kondik and GSP, yeah. GSP was stacking inside Carlos guard and grabbing his head and, you know, and circling right and left to kill the armbar, but he was stacking in. And I was very confused about watching that because I, I think I know that John Danaher was in his corner or something yep. back in the day. And they chose under the brightest lights and under everything that mattered, the belts and money, they chose stacking inside the guard. Mm. And I was like, yeah, but where is this posturing up? What? Oh, and the yeah. can, can openers as well, I think. Yeah. And where is this, you know, posturing up and no, you can't can open because they're going to armbar you. And I was very confused because in Jiu-Jitsu world, everybody's teaching posturing up and saying stacking is bad. Mm -hmm. So, and the evidence is piling up. Jiu-Jitsu guys, they're like getting killed also at some point against stackers. They're always aggressive head forward stacking inside the guard and a lot of Jiu-Jitsu just doesn't work because most Jiu-Jitsu works against people that try to posture up and not go stack in. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that stacking is the best way. I'm saying stacking and, you know, standing up is that they're both extremes. Mm -hmm. You have to do both. But so I'm more about those anomalies that people just go, ah, you know, it was something, you know, anomaly. Yep. But I'm very interested about why those anomalies work. And uh, it's not only one time we've seen those things work, like stacking in a guard or what Robbie does or, or so I'm always curious that, it sticks out to me. I have no clue why, but I'm, I have to figure it out. But I, because I see some, when I see also Robbie there, for me, there's a, like a postural logic there. That why the choke wasn't there, why the hook was gone, why he leaned against the cage, and the punches are kind of weird from that angle, so you can take them more. And then you stand up and you fight the body lock, and then you turn in and everything is good. So I'm not, I'm not saying, that, but people get me wrong. I'm not saying that you should play this voluntary. Probably Robbie would also want to, you know, be facing Colby, Colby Covington. Yeah. Yeah. But if you have no chance, if you put in that position, you have to know what to do. So the likelihood of you turning around and facing your opponent would be higher. Mm -hmm. Because good people will expose your back, so to speak. And then how do you deal with that? If your only excuse is, I will never expose my back, then if you look for evidences, you're wrong because people's back is getting exposed all the time. So why we're not dealing with those things and why we're not building our defenses and then we turn back and face them. That's obviously better than turning away. But we see, if you would see that this theory of I will not just expose my back would be true, I wouldn't you know, rant about it so much. Mm -hmm. But we clearly see people's backs being, being exposed. And then people, the uh, defensive level goes down. And then we see, like, tell us, and kind of nobody can take his back. So why, worry, why, why this kill of jiu-jitsu seems to be disappearing? And then we see wrestlers, they're actually spending a lot of time facing backwards and dealing with people, getting body locks and working with, you know, certain sit-outs and grambies and dealing with those things way, way more than jiu-jitsu does. Because uh, that's good people will expose your back. And it doesn't mean to always take down, but when you know, when you train, then, uh, you know. So it's always kind of like a, the arguments for other things of just avoiding all the turtles and everything is very bad. And it's a logical fallacy. So I'm more for like, and also when I said in the beginning, that's, you know, the sixth position. Mm -hmm. It's kind of crazy that we, we just avoid the five and just concentrate on one. It doesn't make any sense because the likelihood of those five to happen is pretty big. Yes. So, so, and uh, I know it's a different thought process and I know it's, it's a little bit weird and, but that's, that's the evidence. And if you just go, like some people go, I don't like it. So then you're just ignoring the evidence and you know, you're left behind. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, there's nothing personal that you like or dislike Science moves on, life is life, and you have to deal with those things. And you can be prepared, you can make your students prepared, or you can go like, I don't like it. Yeah, and put everybody in danger in that sense. So 
that's kind of seems like a worse idea. It does. It does. And Prit, <laughs> this has been a fascinating conversation, mate. I really appre- appreciate you giving me your time before you're going to film the DVD on the, on, on Panda. I think you said at the start, um, or maybe it was a different position, but I've really uh, taken a lot away from here from where I've started a couple of weeks ago, just in, uh, encountering your stuff and wondering how it all fits into jujitsu to now I've definitely got a, a much better idea. So I'm going to be very uh, interested to see where your coaching style takes, uh, takes its roots over in Estonia and other, and other parts of the world and what fruits it, it may bear. Well, I'm, I'm thankful that uh, people like you are giving me voice uh, that I usually call like first adapters, like in technology, people, some people just get it, you know, and they, it's intrigued them. They don't maybe fully agree with stuff at first, but it still intrigues. And I really appreciate that, uh, what you did and some other people that have given me voice. So, because that's how it goes usually. And then we'll see, and, uh, it's all can be proven wrong or right. It's all under screw, like a testing, but so far we have come up with a, you know, flying colors. So we still keep, I'm trying to be very skeptic about my things and try to prove my own theories and be very grounded and we'll see where it goes, but evidence is piling up. So something's there. Yeah. And I'll I'll be very interested to see where it goes too. Uh, Now, is there any way uh, you want people to follow you if they're looking to get in touch uh, or, or get more of your stuff? Uh, I guess the uh, YouTube channel is there, uh, Preet Michelson. I guess the slash is Micheltron. It's kind of like a, my reference as a Transformer fan, uh, former. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, but uh, Instagram is there, Jits Vulcan. Uh, uh, refers to my less uh, emotional, logical approach. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Facebook is there. I, I don't have a public page, I have a personal page. And everybody can friend me. I usually, if I don't have any common friends, I will ask you, how do we know each other? But I try to, I thought about going public page, but you know, kind of personal page keeps it more personal. Sure. And uh, we'll see if I reach the limit of friends, I guess there's 5,000 or something, then we'll see. But I don't mind people friending me and you know, I get always good feedback and stuff. So those are three things, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. My DVDs are out. Uh, two of out, third is coming, the panda, sitting turtle is coming, so, and uh, yeah, I'm also traveling, the Facebook posts I do, there's some posts about my scheduling, where I'm traveling at the moment, and if you can't find it, so you can send me a messages, and I will try to answer, because I, I get those things, I get messages these days already too, too often, too much, so I have to see how that's working out, because I maybe need a secretary or something soon, so, but I love, I love my work. I love the feedback and I'm still enjoying what I do. So yeah, keep it up. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks so much for your time again. And uh, hopefully we can have another chat in the future and uh, good luck with uh, time on the mat. Thank you very much. See you. Yeah, talk Thank to you later. You have Cheers, been buddy. listening to the Sunny Brown Breakdown. Until next time, you can visit sunnybrown.net to find out more ways to break it down.